Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Joel Svensson, and I'm a product manager here at Atlas Antibodies, and I will help moderate this session here today. We are live here in Stockholm from our headquarters uh, in Sweden. Before we start, we would like to go through one practical point. After the webinar, we invite you to spare one minute of your time to fill in a survey which will show up in the browser when the webinar ends. We appreciate your time and feedback doing this. So the topic of today is importance of reliable antibodies in tumor pathology with focus on gynecologic pathology. If you have any questions about our monoclonal development program, if you want to seek some future collaborations with Atlas Antibodies, you will find our email addresses after uh, the presentation ends. Finally, we are very much looking forward to have an interactive session with you all today. So please feel free to ask your questions and use the Q&A function in the Zoom app. Uh, and you can do that uh, anytime during the presentation. We will gather your questions and read them up after the presentation. So please ask your questions and we will do our best to respond. So with that, I would like to introduce you all to today's presenter, Eugenia Kuteva, who is our principal scientist and responsible for the MAP development here at Atlas Antibodies. So Eugenia, welcome. Thank you. Hi. And uh, you may start your presentation. Right, thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you all for the uh, introduction and to all of you for joining me this uh, session. This uh, webinar on uh, uh, antibody use in uh, gynecological pathology, uh, we will discuss the general principles of uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry and its use in pathology and pay uh, particular attention to the importance of uh, antibody validation for obtaining uh, reliable results. In the second part, we will learn more about the female genital tract pathology and especially the ovarian cancer. And I will also show you some examples of immunohistochemistry use in clinical pathology. And finally, we'll pay some attention to the pathology section of the human protein atlas. So let's start. Immunohistochemistry. What is that? It's the method that is uh, used for detection of uh, proteins in tissues and cells, and is based on the principle of uh, antibody binding to its particular antigen in tissues and cells. And it can be performed either directly using, uh, for example, fluorescently labeled primary antibodies, or indirectly, either using fluorescently labeled secondary antibodies to detect the primary or a chromogenic reaction with a secondary antibody as well. Since its introduction in the field, immunistic chemistry has become uh, widely used in both basic and uh, clinical research, and is used to assess the distribution of proteins in tissues and cells. And it has uh, been uh, also proven to be a very important aid in diagnostics, and not at least in cancer field, where the protein expression or protein expression loss uh, can be used as an important biomarker. In pathology, um, IHC detection of the uh, proteins can be used, for example, for diagnosis of particular tumor type or differential diagnosis between similarly looking tumors, so uh, more complicated cases. But it can also be an essential component that can determine how the patients can be treated so-called companion diagnostics. And uh, the most famous example is probably the hair sin test in the um, breast cancer, where expression, high expression of a HER2 protein uh, will assign patient for the treatment with Herceptin. So <clears throat> this uh, very uh, crucial and central role of the antibody and immunistic chemical assay of course raises the need for very accurate and reproducible immunistic chemistry results as it can uh, harbor some harms or false positive or false negative results due to 
first of all, inadequate antibody. And uh, <clears throat> it is important to understand that immunistic chemical reaction is not just positive or negative. It should be evaluated in the context of uh, protein expression in particular tissue types, cell types, and subcellular location. So-called uh, expected, expected positivity or expected expression uh, pattern, which can actually differ between normal and cancerous tissue, for example. So uh, the protein location may change, for example, from uh, membrane to nucleus or from nucleus to cytoplasm. So one has to take into account which tissues you are looking at and where you are expecting to see the protein. It is also quite important to assess the immunistic chemical assay in terms of sensitivity using low expression tissues and specificity, the absence uh, of staining, for example, in the negative tissues. And that will help you to avoid false positive or false negative results. So in order to uh, provide uh, accurate uh, assessment of protein expression across different tissues and cells, uh, validation of the primary antibody is a very important step. And at Atlas Antibodies, uh, we use both standard and enhanced antibody validation when we develop our new products. First of all, <clears throat> I will <clears throat> concentrate a bit on the standard antibody validation. And here, um, we try to achieve antibody specificity already by a careful design of our antigens, where we use protein fragments between 20 to 150 amino acids long, where we choose the regions with as low identity as possible to other putative protein coding genes. We also validate antibodies in multiple applications and uh, make sure that, for example, <clears throat> the Western blot gets the correct uh, band size. And in immune chemistry, we always use a range of normal and cancerous tissue with both high, low, and negative expression to ensure the proper sensitivity of the antibody. Uh, in addition, different enhanced antibody validation strategies can be also applied, and we will come back to them shortly. So this slide uh, shows you an example of a validation of specificity and sensitivity of uh, uh, antibody in immune chemical staining with two different uh, antibodies against uh, keratin-7. And keratin-7 is one of the biomarkers that is often used uh, in uh, cancer pathology uh, for differentiation of uh, tumors of epithelial origin. And here on the uh, upper right corner, you can see the uh, RNA data um, expression levels for different tissues. And you can see that, for example, urinary bladder and breast have rather high uh, RNA expression levels, while in some tissues such as uh, pancreas and the prostate, we have rather low expression levels, but there is the presence of the protein. And then uh, there is a large number of tissues that is supposed to be negative for uh, keratin-7 expression. And in the upper panel, you can see the immunostochemical staining with our uh, keratin-7 antibody, HPA7272, where we do see expected cytoplasmic expression, strong one, in the urothelial epithelial cells, in breast um, glandular cells, and uh, importantly, in this low expressing tissue, such as pancreas and prostate, we see specific staining pattern in the intercalated ducts in pancreas and in the basal cell layer in the prostate. While skeletal muscle, which is supposed to be uh, negative based on the uh, mRNA expression, is negative as expected. The panel below shows you a different antibody, which was commercially pursued. And uh, it does show specific positivity in erythelium and breast, the high expressing tissues, and the absence of positivity in skeletal muscle, which is supposed to be negative. But if we look at this lower expressing tissues, such as pancreas and prostate, you can see that in addition to staining in the intercalated ducts, it also shows quite high expression, non-specific, in the exocrine glandular cells and also in the prostate, it's not only the basal layer of the cell that is positive, but the entire uh, glandular epithelium shows strong cytoplasmic reaction. So <clears throat> probably use of such an antibody in immunostochemical assay 
uh, may lead you to a quite high level of false positive results. And this kind of uh, histological validation is actually quite widely used in pathology and is accepted. And they can be really successfully used, but um, mostly for the proteins with the known expression patterns. So in case of uh, proteins that are novel or less is known about where they're supposed to be present, um, this would probably not be enough. And you would like to have another layer of the uh, validation that can help you to make a decision. So in this sense, um, additional validation strategies have been proposed. And it has been the International Group for uh, Antibody Validation that has proposed five different strategies uh, to be applied when uh, validating antibodies. And here you see them. And uh, we just go uh, through them and I'll also show you example of the Western lot to illustrate those strategies. So first of all, uh, is an orthogonal validation strategy, which is based on uh, comparing antibody uh, reaction with an antibody independent method that we have actually just seen in this uh, tissue, uh, tissue slide, uh, where we compared protein expression with mRNA expression levels. But you can do it also, of course, in the Western blot, uh, having a high expression cell line uh, showing the band and the low or negative uh, expressing cell line not showing any band. In case you have two different antibodies that recognize two different uh, epitopes, uh, and so-called independent antibody strategy can be applied. So if the two different antibodies recognize two different epitopes of the same protein and do show same staining pattern, or in this case, same uh, uh, bands in the Western blot, like for example, uh, cell lines one and two with a strong expression with both antibodies, three and four are negative with both antibodies, and the cell line five shows low expression. Uh, this would confirm the results of the both antibodies and can uh, thus make you more sure in your results. Especially for the novel proteins where uh, less is uh, known, the genetic strategy can be really powerful. And that uh, is based on the knockdown or knockout of a particular protein of interest. And there, respect to the control, you would uh, like to see, of course, the disappearance or in case of knockdown, um, at least the attenuation of the band. If you have a very low expressing proteins or proteins that are expressed maybe only in few cells, um, so-called uh, recombinant expression strategy can be um, useful. That allows you to have an overexpressing cell lysate, at least to start to validate the antibody with respect uh, of the detection proper band size in Western blot. And last but not the least, is a method based on the capture mass spectrometry. And uh, here it is based on the comparing the size of the protein detected by the um, immune, immune reaction with the size of the uh, protein detected by the mass spectrometry. And these two should be aligned. So at Atlas Antibodies, we use both standard and enhanced uh, validation in application specific manner, meaning that we do validate and perform enhanced validation in each application that a product is approved. And here you can see an example of the anti-P53 monoclonal antibody that shows expected expression pattern in tissues where we see that the tumor cells have strong aberrant expression in the nuclei where the uh, control and normal plants have only very low levels. In the Western blot, you can see example of genetic validation where the expected band is attenuated in sRNA knockout cell lines. And finally, in, in immunohistochemistry, we see the expression in the basal cell layer in the skin, the high expressing tissue, and absence of staining in skeletal muscle, which is, should be negative. So just uh, recently, we did release a number of new highly validated monoclonal antibodies for gynecological pathology. And uh, those included markers of differentiation of ovarian epithelial tumors, different sex cord uh, stromal tumor markers, and markers for the germ cell tumors. 
So in the second part of this talk, we will now discuss how these IHC markers can be uh, of help in uh, gynecological cancer diagnosis and research. Generally, cancer remains one of the leading causes of death, with more than 19 million cases discovered every year and almost 10 million deaths a year. And uh, in women, actually, a substantial number of these cases and cancer-related mortality is related to the tumors originating in the genital tract, especially uh, cervix, uterus, and not least the ovary. You can uh, appreciate from this graph uh, that, of course, breast cancer has the highest um, incidence rate. But for example, ovarian cancer, despite it is not high, um, as high incident rate, has uh, anywhere relatively very high mortality respect, for example, uterine cancer or also breast cancer. And uh, in this uh, second part of the seminar, we will now focus more on the ovarian cancer, which will be the main topic now. Considering worldwide, the ovarian cancer is the seventh most common cancer in uh, women. And it is, as we just mentioned, one of the top leading causes of death. So more than 300,000 women are diagnosed every year and more than 200,000 uh, women will die from this disease. And uh, this relatively uh, high mortality rate is actually related to the fact that the majority of the cases of the ovarian cancer are diagnosed at the rather late stages. So stage three, uh, when the cancer has spread within the abdomen, or stage four, when you already have the distant metastasis. And uh, you can see that if discovered early, it has a very high um, survival and very good prognosis, but it drops dramatically with the stage three and especially four. The uh, challenges in the ovarian cancer diagnostics and therapy um, does call for better understanding of the ovarian cancer diversity, risk factors, and also development of effective strategies for screening and early detection and precision medicine approaches. So we do um, need to develop more effective therapies in combination with um, more uh, effective uh, studies on the biology of the cancer uh, to help us to define the clinical course in different subtypes of the ovarian cancer. These challenges that I have just mentioned are not at least partly uh, related to the uh, fact that the ovarian cancer is not a single, uh, single disease, so to say. It can be characterized into uh, several subtypes based on the cell of uh, origins. So what we have is that the, in the ovary, we have the epithelial cells, we have the germ cells and stroma. Uh, of course, also, sometimes the metastasis can occur in the uh, ovary and that we shouldn't forget. But the epithelial tumors represent the largest part of the tumors and they can be further divided into serous, endometrioid, clear cell and mucinous types based on the histology, histological sorry, appearance uh, of the cells. And the remaining 25% are so-called non-epithelial tumors originating from the germ cell, the so-called germ cell tumors, or from the stromal cells, so-called sex code uh, stromal tumors. So a part of different uh, histo histology, appearance and the heterogeneity, all these tumors also differ in the observed genomic aberrations and their clinical pathological features, including the degree of malignancy and sensitivity to the chemotherapy. For more than a century, physicians and scientists uh, assumed that the ovarian cancer developed mostly from the epithelial cells of the ovary, uh, which explanation was proposed in the middle of the 19th century. However, later, it has been uh, discovered that many of the uh, ovarian tumor cells actually resemble very much the characteristics of the healthy uh, cells from the fallopian tube and endometrium, and that suggested that cancer may actually arise either in fallopian tube and endometrium. And um, the following uh, <clears throat> decades of the research has actually uh, related 
uh, the most uh, deadly uh, ovarian cancer, the uh, high-grade ovarian uh, carcinoma, to the uh, fallopian origin, and the uh, types like clear cell carcinoma or endometrioid carcinoma to the cells originating in the endometrium of the uh, uterus. So it is actually uh, very important to accurately classify ovarian tumors, since they would differ both in the prognosis and uh, therapy response. And uh, we do know that they are not the same diseases. And even though high-grade and low-grade uh, ovarian carcinoma may look quite different, they do represent uh, very different diseases, as high-grade ovarian carcinoma usually presents in the lower, uh, in the elder women, and have much worse prognosis, but it's uh, relatively responsive to the chemotherapy. The low-grade carcinoma is usually found in the younger women and has a better prognosis, but is relatively resistant to the chemotherapy. And not always uh, the classical hematoxylin and eosin staining and assessment of the morphology can be enough for defining which tumor we are looking at. And in this case, um, both immunostochemical staining or mutation analysis can be necessary for accurate diagnosis of the tumor. So in the recently published paper by Kaber and Kang, they have suggested the use of a panel of different immunostochemical markers for ovarian carcinoma histotyping. These are lineage markers include Pax7, WT1, Napsin A, P53, and progesterone receptor. So first of all, the um, marker called WT1 uh, will allow you to differentiate between the serious morphology, where uh, tumors not expressing WT1 can be further isotyped using Napsin A into clear cell carcinoma, or if they do not express Napsin A, uh, would suggest different origin. And based on the progesterone receptor, we will have either endometrial uh, endometrioid carcinoma, which is usually progesterone receptor positive, or mucinous carcinoma, which is usually progesterone receptor negative. Tumors with high expression of WT1, usually a serous carcinoma. And here you can also use addition of the uh, tumor uh, protein 53, P53, uh, which shows uh, high aberrant expression in high-grade high serous carcinoma, and is usually normal in low-grade serous carcinoma. But in addition, as I already mentioned, often the mutation analysis may help you to be sure about your result. But uh, this strategy has been, for example, applied to a number of a large number of uh, carcinoma, which were then reclassified. And we could see that they, for example, endometrioid carcinoma has received the highest number of the cases they that were reclassified based on the expression of WT1 and P53 markers. There we could see that, for example, several cases of uh, endometrioid ovarian cancer were suggested to be, in fact, high-grade serous carcinoma based on the high expression of WT1 and aberrant P53 expression. And uh, why is this important? This is important because uh, a high-grade carcinoma, as you can see here on the survival rate, has much worse prognosis and should probably be treated in a different way than endometrioid carcinoma. So yeah, going back to why is it so important with the correct classification of tumors and the diagnosis. So the reason is that at least the different types of epithelial ovarian tumors, they do differ in the expression of the immunostochemical uh, markers they also uh, differ with degree of um, precursor lesion and different molecular aberration, which taken all together leads to different prognosis in the tumors, where high-grade carcinoma has the most poor prognosis, uh, while low-grade carcinoma has intermediate. And for example, most of carcinoma has a good prognosis. Um, despite this kind of heterogeneity in both appearance and expression of different markers, the first line of treatment for ovarian carcinoma is still platinum therapy. But you can see that basically only high-grade carcinoma shows uh, at least partly good response. 
uh, while many others are either relatively resistant or resistant to this platinum therapy, which actually calls for better understanding of this uh, ovarian tumors and the uh, um, requirement for the new uh, treatment strategies. And recently, for example, PARP inhibitors have been used successfully in treatment of high-grade carcinoma and endothelial carcinoma. And for some tumors that has a high expression of the um, uh, hormonal receptors, such as low-grade carcinoma, hormonal therapy can be used. And for tumors presenting a high involvement of the uh, immune system, also anti-PD strategies can be used, such as, for example, in the clear cell carcinoma. So I hope I have convinced you that uh, ovarian cancer is not a single disease and, uh, and requires for both uh, understanding of the new biomarkers and accurate uh, tumor classification for the patient stratification, uh, which is, should be based both on clinical history, protein expression, and mutational analysis. And taking together all those factors will help us to develop the new uh, therapies for the precision medicine in the ovarian cancer. So here, I would actually like to bring to your attention the Human Protein Atlas, uh, an open access resource for studying human proteins, and in particularly uh, to the pathology section of the Human Protein Atlas. Uh, in this section, the HPA, or Human Protein Atlas, uh, conducted a meta-study using data from the, um, uh, from the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA and combined this uh, um, expression data with uh, antibody expression profiles in uh, normal and uh, tumorous tissues. The TCJ has looked at the um, gene expression levels and uh, have found that uh, um, about 280 genes uh, show elevated expression in the ovarian cancer, and about 1,800 genes are expressed in the ovarian cancer and also elevated in some other cancer types. So among those, we can look here, the ovarian cancer, uh, 152 genes were found to be uh, significantly associated uh, with the unfavorable outcome, and 358 genes were associated with favorable outcome and prognosis in ovarian cancer. And here you can also see the examples of immunistic chemical staining of uh, one of the unfavorable prognostic gene, the MRC, where the high expression of the protein is correlated with uh, poor survival than the low expression of the protein, or example of staining with the favorable gene, TRF2IP, uh, where high expression, in fact, correlates with the better survival. So insights from uh, such a large proteomics and the genomic studies uh, can actually help to give us uh, new ideas about how to look for novel markers in the ovarian cancer research. And as an example, a recently uh, published paper by Yang and his authors implicated um, um, the, um, one of the genes associated with the ovarian cancer, the MRC2 that we have just seen on the previous slide, in the mechanism of action of long non-coding RNAs, uh, which show elevated uh, serum levels in the ovarian cancer in all the subtypes, as you can see, serous, clear, uh, clear cell, and the metroid carcinoma. And the uh, high level uh, of these uh, long non-coding RNAs in the blood actually correlate with uh, much poor survival in the ovarian cancer patient. And they have seen that uh, one of the uh, proteins through which uh, this long coding RNA act is actually the MRC2. Uh, which lies in the core of uh, different reactions, intracellular processes that are related to uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, cell proliferation, cell migration, and uh, invasion. And these long coding non RNA, uh, long coding RNA um, were supposed to be proposed to be a novel um, marker for the early um, ovarian cancer detection. So Atlas Antibodies offers a large catalog of highly validated both polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies, together covering more than 80% of genes uh, that has a significantly favorable or unfavorable prognostic values. 
uh, which we truly hope can facilitate this much needed research in the diagnostic and the ovarian pathology field. We are constantly working on the development of new monoclonal antibodies, both for basic research and pathology. And here you can see examples of some of our recently released monoclonal antibodies, uh, which are relevant for the gynecological pathology and ovarian cancer in particular. You can find more information about these products on our webpage and uh, also links to the human protein actors. So with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, we'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. You will? Thank you so much, Evgenia, for a great presentation. Thank you. And we would also like to welcome uh, some new um, uh, guests that came in during the presentation. And we would like to remind you all that you can use the Q&A function in the Zoom app. And we will then read the questions to Evgenia. Um, but Evgenia, in the meantime, we already have some questions for you. So I'm going to read the first question. Uh, what loading controls are you using for Western blot excluding immunoprecipitation mass spectrometry? Um, we use uh, several uh, loading controls depending on the um, depending on the protein size that uh, we want to detect. And actually, on our website, you can find the, the information on several. We have like a panel of different. Uh, um, uh, antibodies for different band sizes. And uh, the most common is, of course, uh, uh, sorry, um, I just jumped out of my head. No worries. I will have I to check. Can get back to that uh, later on. So I hope that answered the question. Um, here's another one for you. In which tissue are you usually validate? Uh, do you usually validate your antibodies? Uh, as I mentioned, we use like a, a range of tissues. So we usually have about 20 normal tissues that includes different peripheral tissues, uh, um, both epithelial, uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, brain, liver, muscle, uh, uh, male uh, reproductive tissues, and uh, so on. And uh, we have uh, usually at least seven different uh, uh, cancer types, including colorectal, uh, breast, uh, endometrial, uh, uh, kidney cancer, and uh, some others. But uh, often we try also to uh, select the, uh, the, the tissues that are appropriate for this appropriate, uh, particular uh, antibody. Okay, thank you. So we have yet another question. And I'm going to read it. What might be the ways to handle high signal to noise ratio in IHC without the need of generating a new antibody for the chosen marker? Can you repeat, please? High noise? High yes. So uh, do we have strategies to handle the high signal to noise ratio uh, for immunohistochemistry without using um, another antibody? for the chosen marker, I guess, orthogonal uh, validation? Uh, well, you can actually, uh, with the, with the, um, it, it is very um, advantageous uh, to use the correlation between the protein expression and mRNA expression, uh, because uh, in most cases where you have high RNA expression, you will see the high expression of the protein. So in this case, um, you would be able to titrate your antibody in the proper way to avoid the false positivity and uh, still keep your expression levels to the expected ones. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have more questions for you. Um, which limitation does the conventional marker CA125 have for the diagnosis of ovarian cancer? It's a limitation. Well, the limitation is actually um, that the the C125 levels do rise, of course, in the uh, plasma and then the blood levels, but uh, it is um, usually uh, occurs in the later stages of the cancer. And also there is uh, some problems with the uh, high level of false positive results. Okay. 
So do we have more questions? Yeah, we have one more here, a couple of more actually. Um, of the new markets released, which is your favorite and why? Also, which marker or panel of markers do you think are the most important for these ovarian cancer patient subtypes? Uh -huh. uh, all right. Uh... <laughs> That is a good question. I don't. I, I think the WT1 is actually um, a quite a crucial uh, marker because it allows you distinguish the the serous and non serous differentiation of the cells. Mm -hmm. uh, also, some of the markers uh, that I haven't mentioned in this talk, but uh, that define uh, more rarely. Um, uh, observed the tumors like, the, for example, FOXL2 for other differentiation of the ovarian more germinal cells or uh, stromal cells. And what was the second part? Uh, also, which marker or panel of markers do you think are the most important uh, for these ovarian cancer patient subtypes? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, one of them is actually the one that I, 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 I talked about that includes the uh, the WT1, P53, Napsin A, and uh, uh, progesterone receptor. And uh, some markers that we haven't talked about today, but uh, for example, can be very crucial in uh, metastasis uh, uh, settings that can help you to differentiate, for example, between mucinous carcinoma and the uh, metastatic carcinoma from the colorectal cancer, uh, which can be uh, uh, um, uh, SATP2 and the, the, the one that is released now, the CDX2. Right. Then we have another question, uh, actually, actually a couple more. So uh, was enhanced validation used for the new markers? And if, what type of enhanced validation? Uh, yes, most of them do have a enhanced validation and it is the orthogonal validation in this case. So comparison with protein expression levels with mRNA expression levels. And we applied it both in immunistic chemistry and Western blot if appropriate. Okay, super. Then we have a question from Xingang Chen. Can your antibody be used in ELISA test and have your lab tried this? Uh, we actually do perform ELISA internally, but we don't have ELISA as an approved application for our antibodies, but you can use them in ELISA, yes. Okay. So I think we have one more question. Uh, will Atlas Antibodies be releasing multiplexing antibody panels for these gynecologic cancer markers, either for IHC or for IHC-IF? Uh, at the moment, we have the um, primary antibodies. And uh, as I have shown in the beginning of my uh, talk, the, if you have a, an appropriate primary antibody, you can use the secondary antibody, which is fluorescently labeled, and thus combine these antibodies to make your uh, immunofluorescence uh, panel. Uh, it would be, of course, uh, advantages to have this kind of kits already prepared, and that may be something that we should uh, look into. But I can also draw your attention to the fact that uh, monoclonal antibodies usually are of different isotype, and you can use isotype specific secondary antibodies to, in an easy way, achieve your multiplexing staining results. In fact, the image that you see right here in the, in, in the background, or in my background, <laughs> is done with two um, monoclonal antibodies. One is against WT1 and the other from the cytokeratin 7. And both are mouse monoclonals, but of different isotypes. And then uh, we use the isotype specific secondary to uh, detect this with the help of fluorescence. And then, of course, you can build by adding either, either other isotypes of antibodies or maybe some uh, uh, rabbit antibodies so that you don't have the cross reactivity between the secondaries. Okay, great answer. So, if there are no more questions, then we would like to show you the links to our website where you can find all the data about our catalog of primary antibodies for cancer research. You can also follow us on social media where we share a lot of scientific resources like white papers, infographics, and also news about our antibodies and how they are used in, in research. 
Also, you can contact us and you have our contact information here. Uh, if you are interested in getting in touch with us regarding our monoclonal development or anything else. And please do not forget to take the short survey, which will show up in the browser um, when the webinar ends. And for your information, this webinar has been recorded and you will be able to find the video soon on our website. With that, we would like to thank you so much for your participation with us today. And uh, we enjoyed this, I hope you did too. And we are very much looking forward to see you soon. So uh, thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Bye.